I, I want to take a verse from Psalm 34 and verse 8. And we've talked about this before. After you've been doing this for 70 years, it's hard not to say we've done this before. Um, trouble is, I never know where I did it before. <laughs> um, but I do know we have looked at this before. But it, it's um, very alive to me today. And um, it's not what I said before. It, it says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Um, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. It's a very strange scripture in many respects. Taste, that you're immediately talking about eating uh, or drinking. And it's um, strange, especially if not, you're not used to reading the Old Testament. It's strange you, you're going to eat God. Oh, taste, taste God. Um, you're going to imbibe God and specifically discover that he is good. Um, throughout scripture, this idea of eating and drinking is very much to the forefront. And, and I'm not going to talk about that in particular. Um, but if you look at the parables of Jesus, they revolve around feasts and um, invitations to banquets and um, and, and so you go back into the Old Testament and many times they use language like this. Uh, oh, taste, taste. I mean, that's something you put in your mouth and you taste it, whether it's food or drink. But taste, it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Um, well, the whole idea behind that is the idea of union, that, that is, if I put food in my mouth, a very real and intimate union takes place between me and that food. And so this idea of eating God is a very old way, poetic way of, of saying entering into a, a relationship with him. It, it is speaking specifically of covenant because... Um, if you, if you know anything about covenant that we've taught, um, you, you have a covenant which always ends in a meal. Always. Because the whole idea of covenant is union. You're coming together. And so covenant, whether you're Christian or not, covenant can be among many peoples. And that they always end in a meal. And in many places, the meal then stands by itself. Uh, it, I, I've been all over the world, and when you go into many, many countries, uh, they, they don't have the whole making of a covenant. They simply say, eat with me. And, and the moment your hand is on their table, the moment you touch their bread, you have entered into uh, a union, a covenant, and it, it's, it's very serious. And if you say, no, I don't want to eat, then that is a declaration of war. It is saying, I refuse covenant. Uh, that was my, when I first got out there and somebody said after the meeting, I want you to come and eat with me. And I said, I'm not hungry, I'm too tired, and I'll catch you another time. Really good old American thing to say, uh, except I had just declared war. Uh, that was not just come and eat. We're not talking about the state of your stomach. We, we are saying, put your hand on my table and say, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. We are bound as one. That's eating. And it, it's eating covenant. And the whole Bible is based on covenant. And so there, there you have it, that he is saying, taste and see. Eat of God. And in eating of God, you recognize that you are one with him. You are in a dynamic relationship with him. He's in you and you're in him. Or could I say, it is in your face. God is not a theory. You can never ultimately define God by theology. This, this is not just dead words about an absent God. God is not an idea, but he must be known and he must be experienced. 
the same way as you don't read a menu and say that was a good meal. You, you rather eat the food that the menu points to. And all that we know about God must come finally to knowing him. That's what this word is getting at. Taste him, taste him. And notice, um, now I'm really getting down to words, but it doesn't say taste him. It says, oh, taste and see. That, that one letter word, oh, it always comes from the pit of your stomach, oh. It, it is a, it's got everything in it of longing and desire and must. And, and it's as if the Holy Spirit, in fact, it says it in Romans 8, that the, the Spirit with groans that cannot be uttered, the Holy Spirit is interceding for us. And, and so the Holy Spirit, I hear the Spirit saying about you and I, oh, it is a longing, the desire of God that we taste and see that the Lord is good. Or you could say that the longing of the Holy Spirit is that we get beyond forgiveness. You, you realize the intention of God never was that we would just simply be forgiven. The, the only reason people say that or get there or live there is because they believe that Jesus came simply to deal with sin, which means that Adam has become the whole key to the human race. He screwed up. Jesus came to unscrew what Adam screwed. And, and um, well, that's it. Uh, and that's why we go beyond that and say the whole thing is, do you go to heaven or hell? It's all about sin. Is sin forgiven? Really, that is the PS. That's the footnote. There was a de demand. It was a desire. It was an intention. It was a purpose that was before the beginning. Ephesians 1.3 says it very plainly that um, uh, the, the original desire, demand, intention of God was that we should be adopted into the family of the Holy Trinity, that we should be united in Christ. That, that's what it's all about. And Adam, who came a long time after that, um, yes, he messed it up. And so that purpose of God now has got a, is a distraction. That there is a, we've got to deal with this to get there back on track. Jesus didn't come merely to forgive our sins. He came to bring us back on this track. This track. Eat. Become one. And I think it's worth at least mentioning that sin began with eating. Um, if, if you look at it, um, in, in the scripture, it was in eating of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, that sin came in. And it's the same principle that we, we are actually imbibing the lie. Yeah. Satan's lie was wrapped up in the eating of, of the tree. And, and so you could almost say, oh boy, don't take this too far, but... <laughs> What happened in the Garden of Eden is almost a sort of satanic Eucharist that you, you've heard the word of Satan, you've heard the lie. Now let's do it. It's a covenant act of taking in disobedience and rebellion everything that um, is there wrapped up in that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And um, so... I hope you get the point that we have here in this, not just a passing thing. We have the very essence of what the scripture is about, that we become one. We are united at the very heart. We taste and we see that the Lord is good. And that is, I say again, the longing, the craving of God, that we see that uh, and we move toward it. And as we eat, we are imbibing his goodness. Goodness. Goodness is at the very foundation of the Christian faith. Goodness is 
really the same as love. It's a big umbrella word and, and it covers God's goodness, everything from a mosquito to the human. It's God's goodness. And it, and it says God is good. That means that whenever we meet God, we shall find goodness. There'll never be a time when you don't find goodness. That's who he is. It's the very isness of God. And I don't have to understand that. Two and two make four. I don't have to have a, a big discussion about it. It just is. That's, that's what happens. Um, the air I breathe, it just is. I don't have to ha have a science degree to know that. I just is it. Um, and I'm breathing because it is and I is and we is it. Uh, th th this is the goodness of God. It's foundational foundational to all of our knowledge of God. How can you trust someone if you don't believe they're good? The, the goodness of God is the foundation of all trust. That he's not two-faced. He, he's not double-tongued. He never lies. He never seeks our harm. He never plans our pain. He is God who is by his being good. And therefore, all that we know of God, we see through the lens of his goodness. It's God. And that's why a lot of people don't really trust God. Because they've found in their life it's hard to believe he's good. It's amazing what people can easily believe about God. But when it comes to his goodness, then they're suspicious. They're not sure about that. Um... Put it this way, um, when I am in great pain, when some great hurt has come into my life, the first thing that is attacked is the goodness of God. Yes. And, and we find ourselves saying, if you're good, if you're good, why does this happen? Well, let, let's understand it right away. There's no answer to that question. And some questions, therefore, should just be put on the shelf because there is no answer. The, the fact is that in coming to God and believing he is good, when I have at that moment no apparent reason to believe that, then I am healed of my pain. Does that make sense? The goodness of God heals me of the pain that the appearance ha has given to me. God himself has entered into our humanity and deliberately entered into pain that made the incarnate God feel that God had forsaken him. Do you follow me? Yeah. And of course it's taken from Psalm 22. When God himself took our humanity became became man became human and as that man human he experienced such pain such rejection such betrayal that he used psalm 22 to describe his feelings he said my feeling now is and everything that's happening to me at this moment would demand it my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, of course, the whole psalm as you read it is what is going on inside of the man, Jesus. And halfway through that psalm, he reverses it. He says, you don't forsake. You don't, you're with me. And you don't. And then at the end of that psalm, Jesus actually, if you read the psalm slowly, remembering the agony that he was going through in going through it, he said, it is finished. And that's the last words of that psalm. And Jesus used that as his last words. Um, it's, but what am I saying? In that, that there is no place I'll ever be, no loss I'll ever face, no question that I'll ever have, but that God in Christ has not actually been there. His fingerprints are all over it. And he says, I know exactly how you feel. Um, 
That tells me that what I was trying to say before, my question and the pain that goes with the question is actually healed by the God who is good. I'm questioning his goodness, but it's his goodness that heals me. But when I see God who is good became flesh and stepped into our world and there imprinted in that world the goodness of God in the middle of the darkness and the pain that was had one intention in view and that is to tell you God is not good. Does that make sense? God is good. Oh, taste. Eat it. Taste. See that the Lord is good. We, um, we, we see his goodness in, in every, every way. You mustn't um, keep God's goodness locked up in a religious world that God is good because he forgave my sin. God is good because I'm going to heaven when I die. Uh, that, no, God's goodness is everywhere. Um, have you ever realized the people who keep the chickens that laid the eggs that you ate this morning as part of God's goodness that he put that desire in people's heads because I can't imagine giving my life to chickens. But <laughs> God, God, no, have you thought about this? God puts it in people's hearts to do things that I would never do, but I eat the fruit of it. Um, yeah. Thank God for farmers who grow the wheat and, and so on, who raise the cows, messy business, good grief. Why do they do it? And, and um, what we're, we're saying is God's goodness, we meet at every corner. Um, you might have noticed that when we, we give thanks to God for food, I, I don't know if you've been with us in restaurants whenever we have or whatever, but we don't simply say thank you for this food. Because quite honestly, I didn't see God in the kitchen. Um, we, we are thanking God for whoever cooked it. Um, we're thanking God for the people who gave us the opportunity to buy the food. You, do you understand what I'm saying? The goodness of God, we are surrounded by goodness. If it wasn't for the goodness of God, we wouldn't survive. The goodness of God is, is in our very cells. It's... The goodness of God is he not only made us, he put within us the repulsion of disease. Yes. And um, you get the drift. Um, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Why does he have to say it then? And also say it with passion and the all behind it. Because as I say, we, we, we default to thinking God is not good. Yeah. And it's so quickly, uh, the, the slightest thing that happens and immediately, if God is good, you know, why? Um, it, it's it's the, the default to the flesh and it is the satanic that appeals to the flesh. And so we, we question, and I say again, it's impossible to trust God until you've got this settled that God is good. He could never be anything else. And I'm going to meet his goodness at every twist and turn, even in areas of darkness that I can't see him. I, I, that's my healing, that's my health, that's my life. I rest into him. He is good. But I say it's the default. A and we, we forget God. Now, that's the biblical way to explain this. We forget. And forgetting God is not amnesia. That, that, you know, actually, you might, I wish there was another word I could use because when we say forget, it's purely a mental thing that something has left my consciousness and we say, I forgot. Is, and it suddenly dawned on me, I, it, it left, I, I, I forgot, it just was gone. I had a moment of amnesia. Um, well, that's, you can really forget that. Uh, that is not the way the Bible uses the term. The Bible uses the term in the sense that 
something that I fully know is there, but I choose to say it is completely irrelevant to this moment in my life. So something's there, but it has no place in what I'm going through right now. And therefore I dismiss it. I actually ban it from having any entrance into this moment. It is back there. And that's what we do with God that I know full well. Um, maybe some of you have read the same theological books as I have. You know all about it. But there are moments in life of pure insanity when we say this doesn't apply to here. That, that's irrelevant. It was good for the day, but it's no longer good for me. And, and I, it's, I don't go through that process. I just ban it. it it's as if uh, forgetting in a Bible sense is you um, ignore, you uh, don't give attention to. That would be another very good way of putting it. So it's there, but I'm not attending it. I, I'm just letting it be as if it didn't exist. And, and it will gradually get further and further away in my mind. It's just I'm not interested. It doesn't apply. It's irrelevant. There's nowhere to put it in today's world. It was great and it's marvelous to study and I can get degrees in it, but don't talk about, you know, don't give me a Hillary Clinton. Do you, do you remember what she said a few years ago? Now you can go to church and you could hear your preacher, but please don't bring it outside onto the street. Don't you remember that? There's a big thing. That's practical atheism. It is you, God lives in church, go visit him, hear what he has to say, but leave it there. Don't bring it out here. Well, that's, that's biblical forgetting. That's, I forget God. It isn't that I, he's, I've had an amnesia attack and I don't even remember this. No, true atheism in the Bible is to know all there is to know about God and say he's irrelevant to me today. And um, at least in the Bible, they knew they couldn't get rid of God. They just said it's irrelevant. We don't go there. Uh, you go to ancient monuments or um, places, especially over in Europe, and um, you visit the, the old castles or you visit what's left of them. And, and you pay to go and see them. It's very interesting, you see. You go and you, you touch it, there's old stone and people built that. No one even suggests that's relevant to today. No one suggests you're gonna go and build something like that. It's totally irrelevant, but it's interesting, it's interesting. And, and, and you, you give it some attention to keep it going, but the thing is really crumbling before your eyes because I've got better things to do. I've got better things to think about. We do it differently today. Irrelevant. And that's what it is. And, and so you might say that religion, as we have come to understand religion, is a system, a corporate system of forgetting God. Religion actually works at forgetting God. Uh, you see, in, in religion, they don't deny God. Of course they don't. They just say, he doesn't do that today. And so I've got a book. Let, let's put it like this. I've got the menu, but they've already fired the chef who gave us all the recipes. And every time you ask for something, they say it's no longer on the menu. And I, I'm, this, I'm not stretching this. Um, religion fired the Holy Spirit a long time ago. And they, they were not silent about it. it. It's right there written down in their books of theology that the Holy Spirit ceased to have the same place in the church as he did in the, Old Test in the New Testament. It's amazing to me how glibly they say it, how publicly they say it, and how they really believe it, that the Holy Spirit actually was fired. Um, and they give a date, you know, it was 
when the, the effects of the last apostle was over, then the Holy Spirit began to pack his bags. And um, Augustine, uh, is, he was the first one to put that out, that the Holy Spirit left. And um, therefore, don't, don't go to the menu and ask for any of the gifts of the Spirit because the chef left and um, we, it's no longer on the menu. And um, it, it's, it's amazing how <clears throat> mo most of uh, the ways of religion, they cannot understand the epistles of the New Testament. And you notice they preach a lot on the Gospels. But when it comes to the epistles, they have nothing to say because the epistles came after the Holy Spirit came and Jesus said, when he's come, he's going to tell you all about me. He's going to explain me and he came and the epistles, the explanation of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And um, well, take the Holy Spirit out and I read those epistles and I don't know what they're talking about. And I mean that. I don't know what they're talking about. It takes the Holy Spirit to bring you to actually eat the goodness of God because the goodness of God came to us in Jesus incarnate and that the goodness of God carries us in Christ through death, burial, resurrection and ascension. And the Holy Spirit then makes our bodies his residence and the Holy Spirit then opens our eyes and says this and this and this and this and this. Um, well, you take the Holy Spirit out, what do you have left? A crumbling ruin that's very interested, interesting to historians, or they call them theologians, and, and, and we'll pick at it and we'll take pictures of it and we'll have, you know, but there's nothing there. There's nothing there. It's off the menu. The goodness of God then is very hard to understand. Very hard because it's now a theory. It's an idea. How can you, the goodness, what, what is goodness? It's a very broad word, very, very broad. Um, it, it means, actually a definition of the word be pleasant, um, kindness, gentleness, the at-homeness. You could almost say the hominess of God. It's safety zone. He's good. It's okay. It's good. And um, his goodness enters into the, the full expression of goodness is love. And so you have the compassion of God, the care of God, all wrapped up in his gentleness and his kindness, his, his goodness, which extends to every part of our being. The God is good in our essential selves. In my, my deepest self, I can look in the eyes of God and know that he is good and, and good to me. And, and I know that in my mind and my emotions, I can investigate him and only find that he is good. In the very cells of my body, it's a done deal. God is good. And, and yet, you see, religion has told us that's not true. It's not true. God's into your making pain. God wants you sick. He wants you hurting because it's good for you. And um, where do you go? Uh, and God is not good. And so when bad things happen, I say, there's God again. You know, never, you never know. He, he's the one you can never trust because you never know what he's going to go do next. And just when you thought you could trust him, he lets you down. Um, you... You, you notice these days I, I'm walking with a cane until they put in a bionic knee. But um, um, and I, I'm not, yeah, I never, you know, never walked with a cane. And so I had to be educated because um, I had a beautiful cane carved in Mexico. Um, but I put it on the floor and it slipped out from under, you see, because it didn't have that knob on the end. The, um, and people, that, that, many people, that's their God. Lean on him and he'll slip out under you because you, you, he's not good he, he, sometimes. But do, do you follow? I, I'm not exaggerating this. I have faced up with this in many pastors. And it's, we, we are dealing with a God who's good. He's always good. 
He cannot be anything else. He is always good. In fact, it tells me in Exodus that the goodness of God is his glory. When Moses said, show me your glory, um, the Lord said, I will cause my goodness to pass before you. So the goodness of God is the glory of God. And that, of course, it means in one sense radiance, but it's a radiance of light so that the goodness of God is the key to understanding all of life. He's the light, the radiance, and in his light all darkness disappears. And it's in the goodness of God that the, the darkness ends. The goodness of God, the love of God. That, that See, the, the eating in the Garden of Eden of the lie, and the lie was the great question mark on the goodness of God, great suspicion, which brought the darkness. And that darkness was not giving you a bad nature. There's nowhere in the Bible that says that. You don't get a sin nature. Um, the apple or whatever fruit it was, um, was not sin juice. It, it, it didn't... It was, what happened in the Garden of Eden was the descent of a profound darkness and they, that was amnesia, a satanic amnesia. They forgot who God was. They forgot who they were. They forgot who their neighbor was. They were wandering in futile circles. But it's a darkness. That's a head thing. That, that's, so, so sin in its origin is the darkening of the mind. It's, it's the deep darkness of our understanding. We don't get it. We don't see it. And it isn't because we're stupid. We've just got this terrible dementia that we've forgotten who our parent is. We've forgotten who we are. We don't know. Well, the goodness of God is the truth. That was the lie. But now the truth of who God is is like a radiant light. And in that light, you, in the light, you see what darkness is. Is it? It, ta it takes God to turn on the light to show you what darkness is because you thought your darkness was light. You follow me? Yes. In, in the dark, I thought I knew it all. I thought I got it. I'd already arrived. I, I found it in, in my darkness, which I thought was light. But in the light of God's truth, in that light, I see what darkness is. And in that light, I then see what light is. And so you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It's, it's the, in, into my mind there comes this light. He's good, he's good, and he's trustworthy. And his goodness came all the way to actually one with us and carry us through. It's the goodness of God. That's who he is. Now taste him, he says, taste him. And um, we, we have forgotten God. And the whole Bible says, you know, if you know about God and don't know him, then you've forgotten him. So you've got to get used to it. It's a different way of looking at it, different terminology. If you follow after idols and say that this is better than God, this is a, a fresh way of looking at things, then you've forgotten God. doesn't mean to say you're just so stupid that you follow an idol. It says you know who God is yes. and you've made a choice to go this way. So you had to forget. Say God's irrelevant to this situation. My idol is really on, on track. Um, we could keep going, but I, you, you get the drift. that th This walking in a deliberate darkness because I choose not to acknowledge God. That's another way of saying forgotten. Uh, he's, he's there. And, and, but we refuse to acknowledge him, refuse to go with it. Um, and that's what he's saying, in all your ways, acknowledge him. That in all your ways, in all your ways, acknowledge God's here, God's here, God's here. I, I'm walking through his goodness here. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're there. I, I'm acknowledging, I'm, I'm aware. 
of God. He's not somebody locked up in, in Sunday. He, he's, he's, a, he's, he's the very air I, I walk in. He's, and his goodness, as I say, is not limited to religious stuff. God's goodness. Um, you ever thank God for the people who work on the road? You know, stop complaining about the potholes. God just sent them in to... I'm serious. Do you, we, we leave God out of that. That's why just the way society works. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. God puts into people's minds and hearts to do his work of goodness, to look after us, his people. Um, and, and each other. Have you ever just spent time to think about each other? And thank God for the kindness of God that you meet in each other. It's amazing when you realize how, how your life is upheld by just plain kindness. Goodness of God coming to you through each other. And his gentleness and his patience and his compassion through each other. Ever stopped and acknowledged God's goodness, God's goodness, God's goodness. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, see. And we taste by the Holy Spirit. And that's when um, the religion has put the Holy Spirit out of business. Then this text means less than nothing. Because even the wording of it sounds stupid to religion. How can you taste God? Well, of course, it's the Holy Spirit that, put it this way, God the Father, who won with the Son. So the Son is the expression and the doing of everything the Father's goodness wills. He that has seen me has seen the Father. He's good. And then the Holy Spirit, who is one with the Son and with the Father, is now going to take what the Father wills, what has been said in the Son, and he's going to bring it into us. And it's the Holy Spirit that does that. You can never go to seminary to discover that. It's the, the Holy Spirit does that. The fact is, the Holy Spirit is doing it right now as I'm talking. That, that he, he's the one that opens inside eyes and causes inside desires to rise. And, and he, he's the one who is the chef, you see. Okay, put it that way. The Holy Spirit is the chef. And they fired the chef. But then they wonder why they can't repeat the recipes. Um, there's been a lot of that, it's in my head, I guess, a lot of that here in Bandera. Yeah. Um, chefs come, chefs go. And when chefs go, whole peoples go to another restaurant because everything hinges on the chef. He's going to prepare and present. And, and so the goodness of God, all prepared in Christ, all now, in the Holy Spirit. And, and we say, no, I'll go to another restaurant. It's um, irrelevant. It's, it doesn't work for me. I, whatever words we say. But the Holy Spirit is the one, not only the chef, he's the one who convinces us that the food prepared is not poison. <laughs> he says it's safe. You can. This is the love of God. You can eat this. You can... Be nourished by this. It is so. It is so. The Holy Spirit is the presence, the throbbing, real presence of the goodness of God. And the Holy Spirit teaches us. Jesus said that. The Holy Spirit is our resident teacher. But he never, you got to hear this, the Holy Spirit never teaches ancient history. It's not on the curriculum. Wow. He only teaches now is. Yeah. And he only teaches us eat. 
you know, taste. Now, see that the Lord is good. See it, feel it, touch it. Uh, and we'll get to explaining it later on. But right now, teacher says, take it. or you could say this too. The, the Holy Spirit never uses a textbook. And I know many people are going to get upset with me over that. Um, but the Bible is not the Holy Spirit's textbook. The church went for 400 years without a Bible of any kind um, and did marvelously well. Um, <laughs> uh, we, we watched, well, no, we didn't watch. It, it was, um, we, we got into 10 minutes and it was either throw up and keep watching or turn it off. Um, and it, it was, um, what it was, it was a movie that w was to tell you how to witness and, and how to have an impact upon your world. And um, th this fellow got there and I, I could, I shouldn't be so angry about these things, but you know, he got a Bible and the Bible was right in the camera. And he said, this Bible, this Bible will save you. This Bible will take you to heaven. And the whole thing was, do you want to go to heaven? Do you want to go to heaven? No. <laughs> There's nothing in the Bible that says I should want to go to heaven. Um, right? You know, the word is hardly ever used. Isn't that amazing? You say, well, Jesus came to bring us to heaven. Where did you get that from? Tell me, give me the verse. Jesus never came to take us to heaven. Never. Never. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He came to bring us to the Father. Why? Because that's the original intention of God's goodness, that you should be adopted into the family of the Holy Trinity. It's the Father, the Father, the Father. Uh, this idea of a mansion over the hilltop came from a wretched translation of John 14, 1, and then picked up by ditzy girls in Hollywood and saying, I've got a mansion over the hilltop. That's your theology? That's your gospel? No, Jesus came, and in the great goodness of God, the incredible, limitless love of God, picked us up to carry us to the Father and bring us into the same relationship to the Father as he the God-man has to the Father. It's very different. That's the goodness of God to be tasted. Not a formula to go through to get somewhere. It's the person who came to bring us to the person. Yes. Yeah. The goodness of God. And of course, the, the goodness of God tasted... Um, is the opposite of that word forget. A and we've been here many times. But now in, in this context, how do I eat of God? Well, if forgetting is to leave something in the past where it was first done or said and leave it there as irrelevant to today, as forgetting, forgetting. well, then remembering as the Bible, the languages of the Bible um, would say, it is taking something that was done or said or promised in the past, a remote past, if necessary, by which I mean you didn't have to be alive to remember it. That, that's really what got me. Um, when I was young and studying, how, how can you remember something when you weren't there? You know, do you remember that vacation we had in 1700 to Hong Kong? <laughs> no, it's daft. Well, yes, it is in English, but in the languages of the Bible, I don't have to be there to remember it. It's there. It was said. And instead of saying it's irrelevant to today, Biblical remembrance is to pick that up and bring it into this present moment and speak it and do it as if it's fresh in this moment. 
which means, as I said, there's no ancient history. God, the Holy Spirit never teaches ancient history. He always brings it so it's a throbbing now. It's now. And all the goodness of God is now. And when I say now, I mean the very sound I've just made out of my mouth. Now. So it means you don't have to wait until we get all heads bowed and every eye closed and you have some magical moment. No, right now as I'm talking, God is ultimate good, limitless good. And he is that in us right now. The, the feast is set to eat inside of us, not external to us. The Holy Spirit has prepared it specifically for us now. And the moment I say, I'll get round to that tomorrow, you started to forget God. That, that's, that's the meaning of these words. Um, I forget God into the future. I forget him in the future. I forget him in the past, but both are very easy to my flesh. Do, do you follow? You're looking at a little, how can I forget into the future? By saying, not now. He is my life. I'm going to get around to that by next Friday. Um, you've forgotten God into the future. I, I forget, well, the past. And um, that, that's very easy to do. But how many people do you know? They had a, an experience, a genuine experience of God 50 years ago. Never stopped talking about it 50 years ago. And... Um, like the one fellow I heard about, he wrote it down, called it his blessed experience. And any time a visitor came to the house, they would go and get my blessed experience and I'll read it to them. And so what happened to me 50 years ago? <laughs> and they went to find his blessed experience. They came back, they said, I'm sorry, but the rats ate it. We, <laughs> the rats ate his blessed experience, yeah. Um, I, I face that especially this year. You know, this is my 70th year in the ministry. And in February of this year, 70 years ago, I, I had the most beyond words meeting with the Holy Spirit, which not only healed my mind, my emotions, but thrust me from a Tuesday night until Sunday. That Sunday, I began to preach, and I've never quit. And um, the, the most dangerous thing I face, seriously, is to, that was it, yeah. my blessed experience that changed my life. And I could talk about it and talk about it. But I hope you've noticed over the years, I hardly ever talk about it, because... If that's my experience, I long ago forgot God. He, he's boxed. I know God today a thousand times more than I did 70 years ago, to the point where I don't need to mention that anymore, not to deny it, of course, but it's even the way the Holy Spirit came upon me, though glorious as it was, um, I, I knew the Holy Spirit in a greater way getting out of bed this morning. Um, it, it's, you can't, you, you in danger of losing God in our, in our experiences. And, and yeah, that's, I should write that phrase down, shouldn't I? Yeah. Lose God in our experience. It's true, it's true. The moment, yeah, it was, and, and I find, and I, again, I'm speaking as, what I am, a speaker, teacher, you see things in scripture that you had not seen. Yeah. The temptation to write that down as a curiosity, you know? No, you don't know. Um, you, you've discovered something and it fits. It's like you found the ultimate piece of the jigsaw puzzle or you found that Lego piece that it all fits and, and you get caught up in the fittingness of it. Yeah. Yeah. And you're content, you've got the big picture now and, it's, and you can talk about it. That's, that's not tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. 
that's reading the menu and saying, wow, it's got some restaurant here. Um, when, when I see something like that, I usually have to stop. Mm -hmm. I can't go on because that has got to become the food of my soul mm -hmm. before it's safe to leave it. Yeah. Yeah. And this has got to become me. It's, 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 it's not something that I can look at with logic and say how beautiful. It's something that's got to become part and applied now to this part of my life, to that part of my life. This is how I look at this now because of this being the food of my soul. Otherwise, you'll lose God in your scriptural discoveries. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you become an expert. You're dry as a bone. Mm -hmm. But everything is... I, I remember when um, I lived in New York and... I got a pass to go to the Princeton Seminary Library, which was quite an honor, I think. And um, it's a magnificent theological library, mm -hmm. something that students just drool over the thought of. There's probably not a book that's ever been published that doesn't have a face there. And I would go there, and any book I needed, I'd find it. And of course, all of the professors came to the library too. And so here I was in Princeton Library alongside of the professors in theology. And I would ask them questions. I mean, serious questions I needed the answer to. And they would give their answer. And I mean, it's right on. But they gave it, you know, looking at their watch, yawning. And so I got in, I, when can I get out of here? You can. But what they were saying was, was truth. It was, but it didn't excite. It bored them to tears. And they just let it drop out and say, okay, I'm done. And um, that, that's the whole point. The Holy Spirit is our teacher, or we can lose God in our teaching, even if it's true. Yeah. Yeah. See? Taste him. Taste and see. And so, the, as I said, the, 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 to taste of, of God, the Holy Spirit is the one who engineers that. I, I could never explain it. I don't understand it. I don't have to. Any more than I understand how when I eat a meal, it turns into the nutrients that are life to my body. I have no idea how that happens. And I'd probably get indigestion if I tried. And so it's the fact that you, it is so. It is so. And, and the Holy Spirit's main work, I would say, is this word, remember. Because it means you do not have a book of history. The word remember means to take that which is ancient, that which is before you, but it's, a, it's an event. God did something. If he did it, he did it to be remembered. Not, not to be looked at as a crumbling castle in Europe that we'll pay $5 to go and see. When the Holy Spirit did something, Though it be 3,000 years ago, he did it so that it would be working in your life today. Yes. You remember it into this moment. Mm -hmm. You don't remember about it. You remember it into your present life situation. Mm -hmm. He said things, and we say they're the promises of God. They're useless unless the Holy Spirit remembers them into this moment in which I live. Yeah. There is a very interesting little story in the New Testament. Um, Jesus, you know, the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And there was the other one too, the 4,000. And um, of course, the disciples were a very, very big part of that. They, they were not only there. If you read the story very carefully, he fed the 5,000 through them. Um, he gave them the bread, the bread multiplied as they gave it away. So they actually, a miracle was happening in their hands. So that is very real. 
their attitude, I think, was kind of, wow, this is some story to tell to my grandkids. <laughs> well, I, I mean, that's fair enough, right. you know. 60 years from then, sitting there in your rocking chair telling your grandkids, now I was there, you know. It happened, I had the bread in my, I was there. It's quite a story. Um, tell your neighbors that too. My blessed experience, you know, it's, I was there. I think that's how they were because just a few weeks, just a few weeks away, from those, those two men, they're out on the Sea of Galilee and they had forgotten to take bread. Yeah. And so Jesus starts talking about the leaven of the Pharisees, nothing to do with the fact they'd left bread. Um, but they were so guilty that they'd left. I mean, here they are going to have a picnic on the lake and, and they've forgotten the food. And um, they're so guilty and they think Jesus is now reprimanding them by talking about bread so jesus picks it up and he says i'm not i'm not talking about you forgetting bread he said you forgetting bread he said don't you understand and remember and remember jesus was a hebrew he was jewish when he said remember he didn't speak english he was speaking this word i'm talking about do you not understand? Do you not remember the 5,000 that were fed? And how many baskets you took up afterward? Don't you remember that into this boat? That is, he never fed the 5,000 with the intention of it being a magnificent story to tell your grandkids. He fed 5,000 so that 10 billion after that would never have to have anxiety about food again. He was saying, well, well you're, you're, you're afraid we don't have enough food? And you've seen feeding 5,000 people out of the air? You don't remember? That is, you don't bring that happening there into here and say, I don't know how it's going to be, but we, we'll... We'll have supply. There's no more anxiety. I, I have been inside a miracle of supply. And therefore, forever after that, I remember that into this moment. And I, I will never worry about food again. That's, that's tasting. Yeah, yeah, they gave out food, but they never tasted the miracle of uh, multiplying food. That was the goodness of God to those beers. Actually, that was kind of neat goodness because the people were not starving and they really were not far from getting food. We went, when I was there, we went up into those hills and we, we actually ate food right there where, where Jesus did the miracle. And you could look down and you could see Bethsaida, you can see Capernaum, it wasn't that far away. And... Um, it would have been, it was a neat idea the disciples had, you know. They said, look, the sun's going down, it's getting dark, send them away so we can get food. It's a jolly good idea. Jesus said, no, let's have a picnic, you know. I'm being very serious. <laughs> the fact is, Jesus, that was not a bunch of people dying of starvation. So he, no, it was a bunch of people and he just said, let's in." Enjoy the sunset. And um, he fed them. Why, why is it people get shocked that Jesus just enjoys life? You don't, you don't have to be dying to call upon him. You know, Just be happy. Enjoy it. And um, so remember, if I'm going to eat of God's goodness, I remember all that he has revealed of his goodness, all that goodness has done, and I remember into this moment, this moment is the way he is. He is, and I can bank on that. I can trust him. I can trust his goodness. Oh, taste. See that the Lord is genuinely good under all circumstances. 
never fails. And when I've tasted of God's goodness, as with food, tasting God's goodness means I have actually imbibed. I've actually digested. These are kind of crude words for what we're talking about, but Christ in you. Maybe better, Christ inside of you. Yeah. Not as, you know, he's got this half and I've got that half. Christ inside of me, he has become the life and the sense and the logic of every cell in my body. Christ in me. And Christ in me means I now understand God through God's eyes. Christ in me, says 1 Corinthians 2, means you have the mind of Christ. So I see Father as Jesus sees Father. But it also means I understand me. Because huh. remember, the darkness, I'd forgotten who I was. And I begin the journey of discovering my identity. Because Christ is in me, the source of my new identity. But then I look at you and I realize that I've never seen you before. I'm now seeing you through the eyes of Jesus. And all that goodness has given to me now becomes through me. And that's the only way to live this life. See, religion has to leave all that out because they fired the Holy Spirit. Um, so now what do I do? Well, I've got a list of rules here that says I've got to love you. Shucks, you know, I'm stuck with you. I've got to love you. Whereas Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. So first of all, he loves me. He's good to me. And I wake up to that. And when I've fully woken up to that, I cannot help myself but loving you. Because in that light, I see you. So love one another as I have loved you. Yeah. It's the same thing. We pray it every Sunday in, in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive uh, what, you know, those who trespass against us. And people say, well, see, you've got to earn your forgiveness. No, it's talking about an inevitable process. If you are forgiven, you forgive. If you don't forgive, that tells me you don't yet understand forgiveness. Simple. Of course. Um, the parable that Jesus told. You know, the king forgave the man a great debt. And Jesus was really playing at that time. Because if you translate what the man owed the king into today's world, um, the man owed the king more than the national debt. You know, he's saying if this was, and of course the, the guy who owed the king the money, he'd obviously be skimming the top of everything. He's stolen it from the king. And, and his response was, and again, I can see Jesus almost laughing while he's talking. He says, the man says, give me a few days and I'll repay you, <laughs> the national debt. And um, so it says the king forgave him which essentially means that the treasury closed down and everybody's forgiven. I mean, if someone gets forgiven for stealing the national debt uh, and, and stealing it from the king, I mean, this is, it's a crazy story. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. But the, the man has been forgiven the national debt and um, that brings with it a new way of looking at things to the entire peoples, everybody, nation. Uh, the, the treasury is closed down. The, the IRS has been fired. I mean, forget, we're all free. If he, if he got forgiven the national debt, we're all forgiven. And so this man dances down the road. He's been forgiven. But as far as he can see it, he got away with murder. Yeah. That's all he can see. 
no comprehension of what has really happened. And so he finds one of his fellow neighbors, and, and this is where the story again is crazy, who owes him about 50 cents. And he says, pay me. And of course the man says, give me a few days and I'll get it together. And um, the guy, you know, throws him into jail and says, you, you won't come out till you paid me. You follow what Jesus was saying in that insane parable, that once you have been forgiven and know it and understand you didn't get away with murder, you have been forgiven into the very mindset of the king. If he forgives you that much, then I now think as he and forgives you and I forgive you and I forgive you because I can't, this is, did you follow me? And so if he understood that he'd been forgiven, he would have forgiven with great joy all his neighbors. Share with me what I've experienced, now I share it with you. So forgive as you've been forgiven, the two are one. And, and the king wouldn't go back on his word, I forgave you. But he says, you'll never forget what I forgave you. I'm going to, and he says, he sent him tormentors. And the tormentors would just knock on the door, maybe every week, and say, you do know what you, you, you owed the king. And I know you're forgiven, but I never want you to forget. And keep the man under a sense of guilt. The man couldn't ever enjoy being forgiven because he was continually confronted by the tormentors. Isn't that absolutely the truth? I meet people all the time who are living in torment and guilt and I say, don't you realize the finished work of Christ? Oh yes, I understand that, I understand that. Then I said, it must be that you are not passing it on and there are people that you have bitterness and unforgiveness and they're the tormentors now. You, ne you never enjoy your salvation yeah. because you've never passed it on and forgiven the world around you. As you see, when you, when you taste, you eat, it becomes, yes, it becomes you. Christ in you, the whole, Christ who is my life. I live, yet not I, it's Christ who lives in me. It's not fiction. It's an absolute radical change. I have tasted and I have seen the goodness of God, but in tasting the goodness became my very life. And I, it's mine, mine. The, to, to taste, it, it, it does mean that, it's yours. Everything else is secondhand. I mean, that's eating, isn't it? When I eat and I said that was a good meal, that's my private opinion. You can't tell me, no, it wasn't. It's none of your jolly business what happens on my tongue. I tasted it. When I tasted it, I said it was a good meal. That's the end of it. It's mine. You say, it's mine. You say, well, in my opinion, I don't care what your opinion is. <laughs> it's my meal. I ate it. See, that meal is doing something to me. It's becoming my life. Yes. I tasted it myself. It's mine. Yes. And... Um, you can go away and discuss with others my testimony. But that's second hand. Until you've eaten it yourself, you don't know what you're talking about. I, I, I was in a part of Africa once and we had a flat top Jeep. You know how they are. There's no sides to it, just flat top and some chairs in the back and we had a native who took us out at night. That was a stupid thing to do. Well, it is, it is. You, you don't do that. You don't go off into the jungle in the middle of the night. There's no street lights, you know. Uh, and it's pitch black. You've never seen black until you're a thousand miles from the nearest light. Uh, and, um, well, I won't go there, but we, we're out there and we, we were looking for a leopard. We, we knew it was there and we knew it had cubs but we wanted to go there in the middle of the night. And this native guide, he knew sort of, and the driver took us up on this ridge and he said, the leopard is, is down there. And as he's saying that, one wheel of the Jeep fell over the edge 
because I'm sitting right here and I'm pushed right against the side of the chair into the and at that point yes he was absolutely right the leopard told us she was there and told us that she was guarding her cubs I can as I'm telling it I can still feel that moment and to the, the smell of her den the smell of it all came up and we're hanging there halfway over the top of the cliff and by the grace of God, obviously, we got out of it. But some time later, some years later, actually, uh, National Geographic did a special on that very part of Africa, wow. Londolozi. And, and um, they, they were looking for that leopard. And right there on our TV screen, I met the leopard that I had hung over the top of her den, but there was no smell. It's just a picture, no smell. And actually, you know, have another glass of wine. I mean, it's, what, what's, what's the weather doing, you know? There was no fear, no smell. Not even 100% attention to what was happening. It was, it's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. I know. I met that leopard. <laughs> I know she's real. Um, that's many people's Christianity. There's no smell. There's no joy. There's nothing. It's just ancient history. Pay five dollars to touch the ruins. No remembrance, total forgetting. Yeah. You get the message. When you taste and see, you smell it, you taste it, you're in it. It's yours. Because nobody else can take that from you. And as I sat there, there were other people in the room watching that TV show. And... Um, they commented on it, but that's all they could do. Yeah. Yeah. And I realized I was the only one in the room that really knew what that was about. Yeah. I think, you know, we've all been there. Yeah. You can talk about the cross, you can talk about the resurrection, it's as boring mm -hmm. as, or in talking about it, you might be the only one in the room that was there. You smell it, you touch it, yes. I've been there. Taste, taste, see that the Lord is good. Amen.